Ding, 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 ding. If someone you know isn't wearing a seatbelt, be annoying. Good job, honey. You could save their life. I should have had my microphone turned on. I was so distracted by Jake's story and got to thinking about what uh, has happened in his life and how much God has done in his life. And I completely forgot my checklist that I do before I come up here. Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. And I can see you better today. Um, I uh, got glasses this week. And today's message has all, a lot to do in my own heart just with my attitude about things. Um, and wearing glasses is one of those. Another one is wearing seat belts. I, I know that we've talked about buckling up and everything, but I, I don't know what it is. I grew up in the age when uh, the, the restraint for children was usually my mom's arm, and so um, I didn't really ever think of that. And so it has been, in a sense, a hard one to learn. And so this whole idea of the, of the thing dinging, and I actually had somebody offer to me, you know, I can take that loose for you. And I said, no, nope, nope, nope. I got to start wearing, I have to wear my safety belt. And that's how I, I am able to do it is, is it reminds me when that dinging goes off. Wouldn't it be great that if you, every time you needed to remember something, like you're about to do something wrong and you heard ding, 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 wouldn't it be great? Or if you, it, it was a, you were about ready to have an attitude problem. You ever had, anybody here have an attitude problem from time to time? Wow, that was too quick. All right. Um, but yeah, I mean, and right before you have the bad attitude, it starts to go off in your head. Ding, ding. Or wouldn't it even be worse that if we all knew and we heard each other's, you know, and you're starting to talk to somebody, let's say it's at home and you're talking to your, your you know, dad, you're talking to your children and all of a sudden... All of them, all of their dings go off, ding, 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 you know, because their attitude is struggling with what you're telling them or somebody you know or somebody at work, you know. Wouldn't it be bad if you're in front of your boss and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, your attitude changed and shifted and all of a sudden you went ding, 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 and your boss knew just exactly uh, what your attitude was at the time? I mean, imagine that, all right? And I, I got to tell you something, for me, I know that getting your attitude in check is maybe one of the hardest things to do. I, I have told this story before, but it's worth telling again just to show how bad I can be at times. I went to Washington, D.C. with my family. I thought it would be a great idea to try to help them by not making them walk another mile and a half. So I walked the mile and a half, got the car, and I told them I would pick them up over by the Lincoln Memorial. The problem was is there was no pull-offs where you could do that. And so I thought, well, it's not a big deal. I told him where to, where to meet me, and I could see them walking, and here I am driving. And so I stopped right on that road, that's, or the street, that whatever it is, that's right along the Potomac there, and it's real close to the Lincoln Memorial. I stopped right in the middle of traffic. Two cars stopped behind me. I thought, no big deal. I let them get in the car, and I started off. And as soon as I went about, I, I probably went 30 yards, and here is a police officer going, you over, like this. And I was like, oh, no. And so I pulled over, that, that police officer got the last, the two people behind me that pulled, them, pulled us over. That's illegal in Washington, D.C. to stop and to pick up people. Because if you did that, everybody would be doing it, right? And it'd probably cause a hazard. I understand the law, I do. But at that day, I didn't understand it real well because I wanted to pick up my family and get moving. And so I pulled over and... The officer came up. It was uh, a lady officer. She did a great job of writing me the ticket. And um, she had incredible penmanship. And uh, so I signed it and everything. But she, you could just tell she had had enough of people like me all day doing this. And so she kind of just, you know, just the way she was doing it was all abrupt and everything. And so I, I, she said, you can go. And I, 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 so I thought, I need to leave, but I didn't know how to get out of where we were. Turn around, do I, do I go straight and try to go through this way, whatever, I didn't know. So I got out and I looked at her and I said, uh, excuse me, 
Uh, I just want to know which way I need to go. Do I need to turn around? Do I need to do this? Because heaven knows I wouldn't want to do it wrong. Wow. I'd like to say the devil made me do it, all right? But it really wasn't that. She came up to the car. I got in the car. She said, you turn around like this. And she was just giving me good. And I just turned around and I didn't. Got in the car and I was going to go the way she told me. And she stopped me again. And she, like this with the window. I, pull, I rolled the window down in front of my three children and wife. And she said, sir, you need to adjust your attitude. So from now on, every time dad showed any kind of, you know, any bit of emotion about anything, dad, I think you need to adjust your attitude, you know? So uh, we all need adjustments to attitude from time to time, right? Well, actually, Peter knew that. As Peter was writing to a group of Christians who were being persecuted for their faith, I mean, they were having a difficult time being able to manage and do the, just do life. But being a Christ follower at the time, this was about 20, 25 years after Jesus had died and rose again, they were starting churches in Asia Minor. They were spread out all over the place, and they were fighting with the Roman government over their faith. They weren't really fighting. They were just trying to maintain life because the Roman government was coming after them. And many of them were martyred and lost their life for just their faith in Jesus. And so as they were doing this and going through that kind of trial and, and persecution, he was reminding them how they should live. And you can imagine, after a period of time of going through unbelievable stress, an attitude check was what was in, in line. Uh, a lot of us have that going on in our life right now, right? Going through something tough, job loss. Maybe you're feeling a little overwhelmed. Maybe you're feeling as if maybe God has just given up or maybe he's not there. Or why doesn't he just take care of this? Or why do these things keep happening to me? All of that. It can keep, it can keep you on your toes, you know, just saying, God, I, I need help here. I don't know how to get through this. And I'm going to tell you that it all comes down to, and Peter knew it, Peter knew that it needed to be a check of attitude for anybody who was going through it. And so I want to start out, and I want to to give you this. This is really just our bottom line for the day. This is what we'll talk about. It's what we'll end with. We'll say it a couple times throughout. But this is the point. Attitude determines how you face difficulties in life. Your attitude will determine how you're going to face the difficulties in your life. And you want to find the greatest source of security, health, function, everything. You want to know where to go for that to be the case. And for those of us who are are claiming to be Christ followers. We're doing everything we can to follow Jesus and to do whatever we can. This week at Camp Bear Creek, the, the bottom line for all week was follow Jesus here, there, and everywhere. And so to do that, it takes a check of attitude on a regular basis. And so today, I want to take you back to the letter that Peter wrote to them. And he, he sent it to all of these people scattered all over these churches that were meeting everywhere and they were trying to get the word out to them listen i know what it's like you're going through some tough persecution you're going through some tough times right now we know that the emperor nero from the from the roman government he's after you we know that and there are people that are under him that are trying to impress him so they're coming after you as hard and as fast as they can and they're trying to to get rid of christians why because they felt that it was a threat to the world and so when you take a look at this letter and you see some of the things, you'll understand why Peter said an attitude check is what's, in, what's needed. So it starts out in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. I want to say that that is a promise that is true, that that's the case. But really what he's talking about is an attitude of heart when he says this. So let me explain it. Therefore, you've got to know what it's there for. In the past chapters, all right, why, is this, why does he say this now? Because he's talked about how we're supposed to submit to everyone. How we're supposed to 
when we're, we're interacting with other people, when we're dealing with other people, whenever we are facing adversity, even down to the closest of relationships like husbands and wives, everything there has to do with how we treat each other and the submission we have for each other and making sure that we're being considerate and kind and loving and doing everything that Jesus would do in that relationship. And so all the chapters before this was setting this up. He first talks about how Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. Jesus is the one who you go to for everything. Why? Because he, he came here, he showed an example, he preached a new life, he offered grace, he died for sin, and then he rose again from the grave to give us victory over death. And i got to tell you, all of that was why he could say, therefore now, since Christ suffered in his body, which he did, we know that, that Christ suffered to a, an extreme in the, in the execution that they did to him that day when he was beaten and he was kicked and he was spit on and then he was hung on a cross by nails and in six hours he suffocated hanging there as his body bled and as he gasped for air and he died. He suffered in his body. He says for us, anybody who's a follower of Jesus... And this is what scares a lot of people from being followers of Jesus because they're like, wow, I don't want to suffer. I don't like that. I don't like suffering. Suffering's a bad thing. Suffered in his body, he says, arm yourselves also with what? Say the words, the same attitude. The same attitude that Jesus had when he went to the cross. In other words, he knew what was necessary to do. He trusted his heavenly Father and he went through with every bit of the torture and everything that, he went, that happened to him. He did it all on purpose, intentionally. He didn't do it by accident. He didn't come here and say, oh no, they're going to execute me. He knew that was going to happen right from the beginning. That's why he came. He had purpose in mind. And he knew he would suffer. He did it on purpose. So he's saying, have that same attitude. Be willing to go as far as necessary to make your stand for Jesus. Now, you might say that's a tough one to do because that takes a lot of commitment and a lot of desire on our part to actually do something like that. To actually give up who something that is a, com a comfort or a convenience and actually do that so we can follow Jesus better or to follow him at all? And he says it this way, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. If you'll go that far, it tells you where things stand in your life. It'll tell you whether or not you truly are a follower who's trying to actually do what Jesus said. You're willing to give up the things that are, are, are got a grasp on your life, the things that maybe were in your past, the things that were really holding on to you. There's a lot of people probably in this room that could talk about those things that have just been difficult and hard to give up. And, and you're wondering, should I give them up? Do I have to give them up? Everything from the habits and the things that we've, we've, we've kind of gotten used to all the way down to a bad attitude, right? All of that is something that's like, it's hard for me to give up this way of life. It's hard for me to give up these things that were, were so easy for me to do. It's so easy for me to lie and cheat and steal and, and drink too much and to you know, even take it to the extreme and get involved in things that I know I shouldn't be looking at, but I'm looking at it because it just has such a draw on me to look at that. So hard for me. So hard for me to give up the, the pornography or, the, or, or, or maybe it's just a, the, the written things that I read and see. Maybe it even has to be the fact that I'm just addicted to people's approval to the point that I'll put anything on social media to make myself look better or say anything about somebody else to make myself look better. See, that, that's, that's what we're talking about. Here's the point. If you equip yourself with the attitude Jesus had when he came to the cross... You see, his attitude was, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to hang in there. These people, this is why I came. I came because I love them and I'm going to do whatever's necessary. I will take it to the farthest extreme, which he did. He died. Gave up his life. He suffered. Every time he took a, a, a whip on the back, it was for you and me. Every time there was a nail, a, a hammer hit a nail, it was for me and for you. And every time he had that, that idea in his mind, 
He says, Peter says, now that's the same attitude you've got to have. And if you go that far, if you get to the point where you have the same attitude Jesus does, you're not going to want that kind of stuff in your life anymore. You're going to understand. It's a point to where you get so close to Jesus that you say, you know what? This stuff is distracting me from him. I don't get to do this anymore. I don't get a chance to be with him like I did. And it's, it's keeping me from him. It's putting a barrier between me and God. The more I do these things that were in my past, these things that were there, the more I do them now, the, the farther it pushes Jesus and God away from me. And I don't want that anymore. See, that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about a a heart attitude that if you're so close to to Jesus to the point that you'll serve him and follow him the same way he followed his heavenly father, then it's going to show and mark in your life because sin won't be something that you want to do. Now you might say, how in the world do I ever get to that point? Well, everybody needs an attitude adjustment. Your attitude will always need adjusting. Okay? Don't ever think that you're going to arrive. Matter of fact, many people think that if they become a Christian or if they actually decide to be a follower of Jesus that they don't have to worry about the past. Everything just goes away automatically. It doesn't do that, does it, Jake? Well, I can tell you I know it doesn't go away. You know? Every day I need an adjustment of my attitude. I have to. If I don't adjust my attitude on a daily basis, then I can tell you I'm going to find myself back doing the things that I did long before, and I won't have the same attitude. Your attitude will always need adjusting. And how is that? Well, the first thing, and, and in an attitude adjustment, you got to work on you first. You have to work on you first. You see this in the way that that Peter taught throughout the whole book. We're, we're, now, we're now going back into the things that we've heard over the last several weeks. And if you haven't been here, that's okay. Just listen. I can tell you, you can go back and read it, and you can see that Peter was saying, look, there are things in your life, and, and really, you, it's not about looking at everybody else and saying, man, they need to get their act together. <laughs> this world is going to hell in a handbasket, right? Right? And so we, we look at everything else and we point the finger at how bad everything else and everyone else is and we forget that the greatest adjustment of attitude and, be, and, and the way we live has to do with us. It starts with us. So you've got to work on you first. The next thing is this. Your attitude will always need adjusting. So don't get sucked into what will cause you to struggle. In the verses that are after this, I want to read these for you. This is verses 2 to 4, and I'm just going to read them, and I'm going to put them up here. I just want you to listen to the list, all right, that he says. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. This is people who are saying that they are going to stay away from sin. They're not going to live that way anymore. (laughs) And this is great. He says, but they're going to live for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. And remember, we talked about the word pagans before. Pagans are people who I like to call (laughs) pre-Christians. They're the people who still have a love and a desire for for their own life and what they want to do and the selfish things that they want to do. And so when he speaks of pagans, he's just talking about people who don't have Jesus yet. All right? That's his word for it. But for us, it's just any of us who don't know Jesus... This is what they choose to do. They live in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. (laughs) And they tend to be surprised that you do not join in them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. How many of you have ever had friends? Don't don't say, don't raise your hand or whatever, but maybe you had friends in the past when maybe you lived a certain way. Maybe you attended some of those activities. All right? Maybe that was a big deal. Or maybe, even today, it's hard for you to give some of that up. You, you want to follow Jesus, but it's hard to do. And so you're seeing these things, and it's like, I don't know. It's bringing, it's, there's so much instability in my life that I don't know how to deal with those things. And so I'm trying to figure my way through. So you're, you're hanging on to the past or whatever, but you've had friends who have tried to get you to keep doing it, all right? Friends that call you up and say, hey, man, why don't we go do this or this or this? You know, man, I don't think so. But what, you could come over and watch a game tonight. That'd be all right. No, man. Come on. What happened to you? You used to be fun. Never heard that. Never heard that. 
And so that's the kind of thing he's saying. There, there, there are going to be people around you, and as you become a follower of Jesus and your life starts to change, then there are going to be people kind of going, what's going on with him? What's going on with her? I don't understand it. What happened to them? And they might even get to the point where they might poke at you a little bit and say, come on, what's wrong with you, you goody two shoes? Right? Let me just tell you something. Your attitude will always need adjusting. And peer pressure is not just for the younger generation. I've heard it stated many times, boy, I just I feel bad for students these days. You know, in middle school and high school, you know how bad peer pressure is. Okay? Every one of us who are older than being a teenager know exactly that peer pressure does not disappear. Right? It doesn't disappear just because we have, you know, it, it's, it's part of life. It's part of every generation. Everybody has this pressure on them to either go back to the way they used to live or things they used to be doing or whatever. It always happens. And Peter knew that. So it takes an attitude adjustment to have the same attitude Jesus had, so focused that it chases sin away from your life. Okay. But the next one is this. Your attitude will always need adjusting so expect to face a pull from the past. Always expect it. Don't think that it's just going to go away. It will not just go away on its own. All right? It will always be there. Your past will always be there. You'll always go back. I can tell you this, that there are certain things that trigger my memory and take me back to when I was 17 years old doing really stupid things. Things that my parents really, even to this day, never really ever found out that I did. And, and I think to myself, okay, great, I got past them, I didn't get in trouble, but it didn't do anything for me. I, I can tell you that be, because of that very thing, it delayed God working in my life. I delayed God from working in my life. And I can tell you this, um, one of the greatest times I remember with my dad was my dad adjusting my attitude. And one of the ways that he would adjust my attitude and he would, he would remind me of things I shouldn't do is this ring. I've mentioned this before, and if you're new, you, may, you haven't heard the story, but this is the ring that my dad would adjust my attitude with. Now, not like this, all right? But my dad would just very easily turn it around to where the stone was on the bottom, and he would just come up behind me and just... You know, just pat me on the back of the head. It was not like his normal hand, okay? But he didn't smack me with it. He wasn't abrupt. He wasn't harsh. He wasn't hard. But he knew when I needed an adjustment of my attitude. And he would just, you know, quietly just... And if I saw my dad doing this, I knew something was coming. If I saw both hands go together, I knew it was coming, you know? And I'd do anything I could to get out of the way because I knew he was going to tell me. But you know what? I knew usually in advance. I knew in advance, and as my dad and I, as I grew older, you know, and, 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 and everything, and got older, I, I, I had this independent streak in me. <clears throat> Anybody have that problem? And, and so I can tell you that I didn't always like those attitude adjustments, but I can tell you that those attitude adjustments with this ring was just a reminder that my dad had his, had his eyes on me. And that he was, he was moving me in the right direction to keep me from doing something that I would regret or be sorry for. That's the same way that God does with us. And that's the same attitude we should have is following the attitude that Jesus had so that we actually don't find ourselves being reminded all the time of what a stupid thing that was to do. I can tell you that our attitude should always be modeled after Jesus' heart, after his heart, not after, not after what we want or even to impress someone else, but our attitude should be modeled after Jesus and his heart. The, the problem is a lot of times we think of Jesus being so, so harsh with us, and it's as if God, and many people will have this idea and, and I, I, I put this statement together. I've said it a couple times the last few weeks, but I want to make sure we understand this, that Jesus didn't come here to like constantly berate us and to beat us and to get us to change the way we behave. 
This is what Jesus, this is the key. The harshest words Jesus used were for those who were focused on the behavior of everyone else and not looking at their own attitude of heart. You see, many times we think that if we can just, you know, we, we look at other people and we put the focus on what other people are doing and how other people are so bad and everything, it actually takes a lot of the, the focus off of ourselves. And we'll end up, I mean, let's just face it, a lot of us will end up, we look at the things happening in the world and we see groups that obviously are not following Jesus or individuals or people, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. We'll see them not following Jesus and what happens, we actually focus on their bad behavior and on what they're doing and we kind of tout how great Christianity is or how great following Jesus is, but we not one time in the process go, oh God, thank you for the grace you've given me because I could be right there. I could be doing things that are not pleasing to you. I could be doing things that are so opposite of you. And I'll tell you, you are just one attitude adjustment away from that. Every one of us. I'm, I am one attitude adjustment from my from my issues and the things that have been in my past to come out and come to the top and just go right, and make a mess all over everything. You've got to remember, Jesus was there to make sure we're doing it. We, we're not, it, it, it. Christianity is not about changing your behavior. I, I think a lot of times we see that, you know, and, and we, we think of it. I, I, read a, I read something that a pastor that I know, uh, Rich Viotis, he said this, Behavior modification without heart transformation will eventually lead to spiritual desolation. If all you're trying to do is change the way you behave, you know, and just put on a front so other people see it, if all you're trying to do is change that without your heart really being changed, you see, the attitude that was spoken of, that Peter was talking about, was is that it's an attitude Jesus had in his heart. And he said, that's why he came. This is why he suffered. Why he was willing to go to extremes in his life. That's the attitude we have to have. The same attitude. Not an attitude of, well, if I just straighten up and fly right. If I just straighten up and be a good person. Sometimes we even think, if I just straighten up and go to church. Okay? Let me just tell you something. You can come in this building and sit in these chairs and you can get up after it's over and leave. Any of us can do that. We can come in this building and we can come in with an attitude. Okay, if I come in here, God will somehow bless me or do something for me. And I want to tell you, it has nothing to do with your presence in the building. It has everything to do with the transformation that happens in your heart that God does all the time. See? And so many of us, we get, the, get our focus on the wrong thing. We're thinking of, of behavior and can I just, okay, this is Father's Day, and I just say this to dads, grandpa, anybody, to moms even, everybody here that's raising kids or you have influence in your kids' lives, listen, you're not trying just to be, get them to behave the right way. You want them to live. You want them to have an everyday faith, something that has touched them. You want them to have the attitude of Jesus. And I want to tell you, your children... Your grandchildren are only given to you for a short period of time. Your, your job as a parent, as a grandparent, at, at all of us, our job is to make sure we're getting them ready for independence, to live on their own and to be out there and be able to do what all, all the things that you're able to do. They need to know how to do it without you, without you. You're not trying to get them to just make you look good, okay? And... Can I just say this? I, 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 the soapbox. I never really do this very much, but enough of the parent shaming on social media. You know, Don't look there for what people are saying you need to do or how you need to do it or how you do these things. Let me just tell you, the attitude that Jesus had is what you want to, want to see instilled in your children. And the best way is by living it by example in front of them. That's how you do it. Okay? So, enough of the soapbox. Okay, but I hope, hope you understand how important it is. After he told them all of these things to not do, that list Peter was talking about, all these things you shouldn't do, and just expect to get you know, people make fun of you and everything, then in verse 5 he says this, Look, don't worry about everybody else and all their behavior and how they're acting. Don't worry about their attitude. Worry about your own because this, they will have to give account to him, Jesus, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Listen, there's only one person really that should be doing any of the judging, okay? 
And that's the one who's perfect, the one who actually died for the sin that we sometimes point out in other people's lives. We have to make sure that we're not judging them, but we know that eventually this is going to happen. There's going to be an account of the things. I take you back to the bottom line. And remember this, attitude determines how you face difficulties in life. And you know why? He, he knew this was an important thing. He was getting them ready for this, and then he dumps this big sentence on them. It's kind of short, but it's there. Read it with me. The end of all things is near. When I was, uh, when I was in high school, this scared me to death. You know why? Because I thought, okay, the end of the world's coming I would hear stuff about this, like it's going to happen and all this. Let me just tell you something, though. If you're close to Jesus, you're not going to fear seeing Jesus. You're not going to fear what the end will be, all of that. When he said this, he was trying to get them to realize that the time we have should not be wasted. The time we have is something precious given to us. And it's, an, it's not about doing what we want or filling our time with the things we need. We can't waste our time. So we add to it the things that he said that you have to do. These are the things that are marks of someone who has adjusted their attitude. Somebody who has gone back. And so that when you face difficulties in your life, you have the right attitude for what's coming. He says the end of all things is near. That's the attitude we ought to have. I've got today. That's all I've got. I've got to re make the most of it. I can't waste it. I've got to do everything I can to serve Jesus. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm stretching this day as long as I can. I'm wringing the sponge for everything I can. I don't want to waste it. He says, therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Prayer is a big part of a Christian's life. It's the thing that buckles you in the most. And I want to encourage you. Listen, God will hear you no matter what you're talking to him about, no matter how you're sharing. Don't be afraid to pray. God already actually knows your heart even before you utter a word. So just ask him, invite him into your thoughts and what's going on in your heart and mind right then. You know, God, I don't know whether you know this or not, but I lost my job. As if God didn't know that. We pray, oh God. Uh, be with uh, so-and-so in the hospital. She's, you know, in room 322. God says, I know I'm already in the room. I was there before you knew about this. You know, we're not, not catching God off guard with any of this when we pray. That's being alert and sober-minded. Do you pray about the things that are going on in your life? Are you praying for our church? Do you pray for this group of people? Do you pray for our opportunities like on July 2nd when Cameron Babb will be here? Are you praying for your friends that you'll invite to come and be a part of that and to hear Cameron's story? Let me tell you, they're going to hear about Jesus that day. They're not going to hear about, I mean, they'll hear about football, okay. But they're going to hear about Jesus that day. Don't you want to make sure, you know? It's, it's incredibly important. Alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. It goes on, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. You have somebody in your life right now that you say, I just can't love them anymore. I can't. I can't love them. I can't do it. Let me just tell you something. The same attitude Jesus had was he easily could have looked at any of us. Okay? He could have easily looked at any of us and said, I can't love them anymore. I cannot love Greg anymore. Look at how he acts. Look at what he does. <laughs> Look at what goes on inside his mind that nobody knows. He easily could do that. But you know what? Love covers a multitude of sins. And Jesus, the love that he showed on he gave us on the cross and he showed us all of us it covers that multitude of sins that we have done. So if you can say in your heart, I just can't love that person anymore. I can't deal with that person anymore. There's no way I can actually be a part of their life anymore. I just can't do it. Well, let me just tell you something. Whew, it needs a, you need an adjustment to your attitude. Much like Jesus. I, anytime I look at somebody and I can't forgive them or I can't love them, then i got to go back and adjust my attitude. i got to do that. And this is even better. The verse goes on, verses go on, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. 
Do you, do you know what that means? It means it doesn't matter how bad your day is, okay? When you come in contact with somebody else, you have an opportunity to show them Jesus. And then after you do it, you know, how are you today? Good to see you. Boy, I hate them like that. They drive me nuts. I wish they would just want to know I really like that. Okay? You know? Remember the cartoon character, the dog, the, the mutt, or whatever it was? Remember? This was years ago, so some of you are going, what? What's a cartoon? Um, it, it was what it was before YouTube, okay? Maybe that'll help you. All right? It, it just this, you know, you know? And you'll do something for somebody. You'll serve them. Hey, my, you know, my truck broke down. Could you give me a ride? Hey, by the way, I, you know, um, I could, while you're taking me on a ride, could you stop and get me something to eat too? I'm kind of hungry and I don't have any cash. You know? Sure, do it, whatever. <laughs> hospitality means that we would treat them the way Jesus would treat them. That's what hospitality is. We look at other people and treat them the way Jesus would treat them. And then this last part. Got to keep moving. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We all have been given abilities, talents, even gifts that God has given us to be able to share and to build other, other people up to do this. We should lean into that. We can't not lean into it. And then I love this part. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Go back over the last words, you know, put the word cloud above your head this week and say, oops, that exit out. That was not a God moment right there. Right? You ever had one of those? No, yeah, I have. And then it goes on. Because it says, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Everything is about Him. It, it, it isn't about us or what we get from it. The attitude is, is what can I do to make Jesus look good today? He deserves that. That's my worship. That's my way that I praise Him, is by doing everything I can to, to pass him and his life and his teaching and his grace and his mercy and his love, everything I can do to pass that on to other people. That's the attitude I've got to have. And he says you've got to do it by making the most of, of the time you have. Let me, let me just walk you through this. Make the most of the time. Rethink what you do in light of Jesus. Everything you do, rethink it in light of who he is. What he's done for you. What he's done for us. And then make the most of the time, consider the needs of people around you. Don't just walk through life aimlessly and not see on purpose. Make the most of the time. Adjust our attitude. If we do that, we actually see. We have the same attitude Jesus did. He saw everybody. Jesus hung on the cross and he looked at the people who had done it to him and he said, God, forgive them. I don't think they know what they're doing here. I don't think they even realize what's happening. That's how Jesus looked at them. And make the most of the time. This is great. If God has made you capable, then lean in. Okay? Stop sitting on the sidelines. COVID is over. Okay? COVID's over. Lean in. Serve. Use the gifts and abilities and talents and resources you have and lean in. God can use you. It can be amazing. What can happen? And make the most of the time. Only say what sounds like Jesus. <laughs> Does my words, do my words sound like something Jesus would say? That's a good measure of whether the words we're saying are right. That's what a Jesus follower does. That's the same attitude Jesus had that Peter talked about when we started. So I take you back to that big statement again. Attitude determines how you face difficulties in life. Everything that comes your way that may be hard for you, that you might say, man, this is a rough road. The way you buckle up is by an, an attitude adjustment, using the attitude Jesus had. And the more we read his word, the more we pray, the more we do those things, the more we serve and the more we hang out with each other and get encouragement from each other and then invest in the lives of people who maybe don't know Jesus, 
the more we invest in them and, and invite them to join us, that's, that's when we see God moving. Let me just tell you, this is what's great. He wrapped it all up with this verse. I want you to say it with me. Because this is what we ought to be able to say at the end of every day if our attitude has been where it should be. All right? This is it. Say it with me. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That should be the mark, the measure of a good attitude. Because it should all be for his glory. Let me just tell you something. It's worth following Jesus. And it's worth, it's worth the effort to have him adjust your attitude. I'm glad when he adjusts mine. Because I need it all the time. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being the cornerstone. The one that is at the center of our lives. The one that gives us foundation. The one that gives us everything we need to live our lives. So, God, I, I commit this to you today. And thank you that we've had the opportunity to look at your word in a way that can change us and shape us and change our attitude. God, you're, you're an awesome God, and we love you. Thank you for being an incredible heavenly father. It's in your name I pray. Amen.